meeting. It is a special meeting as authorized by the governor's emergency executive order on March 12th. This meeting will be conducted via video conferencing and we are live streaming this to YouTube where it will be available afterward as well. So this is a special meeting, meaning that no business can be considered at a special meeting other than that which is on the written agenda. Uh, anybody who is uh, viewing this of the public who wishes to address the board during the board meeting for an item that is on the agenda are asked to submit the telecommuting public comment form that is available on the UUSD.net website as well as on our Facebook page prior to the start of the meeting. If you are able to submit one afterward, we will certainly make sure that that information gets to every board member. If you're unable to access that form, you may also email your comment to Debbie or Nellis at UUSD.net and I will give you that email address. D as in Debbie, O-R-N as in Nancy, E-L-A-S as in Sam at UUSD.net. Staff will make all attempts to share and record the submissions prior to and during the meeting. However, depending on timing, late submissions might be provided after the conclusion of the meeting. So welcome, we're gonna do a quick uh, roll call here. Um, Trustee Arkin. Here. Trustee Diaz. I had muted myself here, sorry. Wonderful. Trustee Nelson? Here. Trustee Fernandez? Here. Trustee Van Sant? Here. Trustee Barrett? Here. Okay. So Carolyn, just so that you know, Trustee Barrett, we can um, hear you, but we cannot yet see you. Hmm. So if we'd like to stand up in our respective spots and do a flag salute. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic of the Virgin States, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That is the most impressive staff I've ever seen, that they were able to get that up before we even asked for it. Is there a motion to approve the agenda for this special meeting? I so move. Is there a second? I'll second that. Wonderful. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Do not hesitate to wave your hands if there is something that I haven't seen um, by clicking on your, you can click on the button that raises a hand. Some people on Macs, that's harder to do. Um, you can also just wave, that's fine too. There is a recommendation that you leave yourself muted so that there's not a lot of feedback and then touch your space bar when you want to speak. And I'm sorry for interrupting Please. The hand on a PC, is that easy to um, share with me where I can find that? Um, on a PC, it's at the bottom of the screen toward the right and it's called a reaction. Thank you. So that could not, that could just really be a clap, not a, uh, not a raising of the hand, but we're gonna we're gonna ignore that anyway. I keep trying to get out of it. Apparently, it just disappears after a few minutes, so now we're stuck with clapping hands. Those of us who were very participatory. Um, are there any other questions before we go further about the logistics or the mechanics of all this? Is everybody able to hear and doing okay? All right, great. Thank you so much to the Information Services staff and to Ms. Ornelas and Superintendent Cuban for making this all happen on such short notice. We appreciate that. Um, so our, our order of operations here is going to be, we're going to have our presentation from Scott Sheldon of Terra Realty. 
Um, he will be walking through the PowerPoint presentation that is attached to the board agenda. Then we will receive public comment and then we will go into board member questions and discussions for staff or for Terra Realty. Is that acceptable to everyone? And then depending on how many um, public comments we have, we'll make a decision at that time about how much time um, you'd like to spend on that. So we will now move to our only agenda item tonight. And I just wanted to make sure as I introduce the Hopland Elementary and Redwood Valley status update that we remind any viewers that this meeting will not have a decision by this board. This is continuing our two year long effort to fully understand and investigate all options for what we can do to serve our students and what we can, um, what our legal options are, but there will be no vote tonight, just so that everybody is very clear on that. Um, so continuing in the many meetings and many um, agenda items we've had before this board and then meetings at both Hopland and Redwood Valley, we're gonna continue the discussion tonight. So Scott, would you care to walk us through your PowerPoint that you have shared with us? If you are ready for that, I am ready also. So, um, so just in way of introduction, my name is Scott Sheldon and uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President, um, members of the board that are all here tonight, as well as Superintendent Kubin for uh, putting this on. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you right now that this is my first video conference for a public hearing. Um, we've done lots of reports and uh, uh, events for many different uh, public agencies, but this is our first. So I'm hoping that this will go smoothly from my end. And, uh, and we're going to start with the... Um, There we go. So if you could all let me know, at least that are uh, on the board level, that you can see the, this is the very first in the PowerPoint. Yes, I can. Awesome. Scott, if you would go to full screen, it's not 100% necessary, but that would be um, better for my aging eyes. How's that? Me too. Uh, I think when you start playing your PowerPoint, it will be a full screen. So if you just go to slideshow and present, it will um, it will get going so they can see the whole screen. And I know we did this. Um, here we go. <clears throat> Fabulous. How's that? Does that work? Yes, thank you. Very good. So um, again, in, in terms of introduction, thank you very much um, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, we have been working with the Ukiah School District for the past two years. And this in some ways is a culmination of a lot of that work and a lot of um, uh, effort that's been put in uh, by our company, Terra Realty Advisors, as well as by the district, uh, staff, board, et cetera. And uh, I'd also like to say, just in terms of an introduction, that uh, our, our, from our company to all the residents in Mendocino, we're really, really hoping that uh, we can get through this COVID-19, um, get back to regular board meetings, and that all, uh, everyone stays safe and healthy. So I'd like to pass that along to all from, from our company. Thank you. Equally. So I'd like to start out, it's always good to have an agenda and it's always good to have an outline of what it is that uh, we would like to talk about. So let's start with that. Um, so again, we're gonna talk about two different sites that are owned by the district and have been operating in the past as a school site. And that's the Hopland site and the Redwood Valley site. Uh, the district engaged our firm a couple of years ago to assist them in understanding what these sites were, what they might be able to do on behalf of the district and uh, market forces and, and influences that, that should be considered in terms of positioning and in terms of uh, what the, the board would like to do to have them have the most information possible to make the best possible decision. As part of that, and what we always do is go through a fairly extensive due diligence process. 
um, both the, for the Hopland as well as Redwood Valley, no exceptions. Um, we look at these sites like they are going to be developed by somebody. We understand what the markets are. We understand how developers look at these kinds of things. And uh, so we take a look at that in terms of putting together our due diligence, putting together what the opportunities and constraints would be. Uh, so again, everybody is making decisions based on really good real-time information. So um, in terms of that, then we roll into uh, uh, the summaries and our recommendations to the board and the district, and then talk a little bit about process of what our recommendation means in terms of, uh, you know, if the board chooses to move forward, here's the process that we recommend, and then what does that mean, and what steps are there that the, the district will have to go through in order to accomplish that. And then we wrap that up with an executive summary and then questions and answers, which uh, uh, Board President uh, Mogard has already said will come at the end of this. So let's start with Hopland. Um, and this is a little bit of a history, and I think that's important for the board as well as the public to understand that the district has been looking at uh, both of these sites, and we're starting on uh, the Hopland and Redwoods. Um, for quite some time. There was a 7-Eleven committee that was put together to study, study these sites back in 2008-2009. And uh, just in way of 7-Eleven, uh, it, it's not what many people would think or what would first pop into their mind in terms of let's go get a Slurpee. It's actually uh, a mechanism in the Ed Code that uh, districts, if they're going to do something with their property, need to put together a community group that is formed of community members, business members at large um, of anywhere from seven to 11 people. And uh, so nothing magical about that, but that's what's in the ed code. And uh, so that was what was done. There were 10 public meetings that were held. Uh, and again, this is in 2008, 2009. There was community input, there was staff input. At that time, the district was facing declining enrollment and uh, the results in the report that was given back to the board uh, at that time was that both of the sites, both uh, Hopland and Redwood Valley were identified as sites that could be closed due to declining enrollment. And both sites were ultimately closed. Now let's fast forward to just a couple of years ago. In 2017-18, the district again formed a 7-Eleven committee to study these two sites and to get additional input from the community and from other people in that area on what these sites might mean for the district. And uh, the recommendation from that committee, and there's reports that are available. I know the district has these, uh, I believe online, uh, uh, Superintendent Kuhlman would be able to confirm that, uh, but uh, they are available. And uh, the, the recommendation to the board uh, back in 2018 was to declare both sites as surplus. And what that means is that the district doesn't anticipate needing these sites in the near future or even in the future. Um, so it, it's something, again, it's a very common process that school districts in the state of California go through. And, uh, and again, that's the reason why they do that. So then they can do alternate uses for those sites. So the district also was brought up and we, we understand this also that having closed school sites is not just a zero sum game for the, for the district or for any district. There are uh, payments that need to be made to maintain these sites. Uh, there are, you know, and then there's foregone uh, opportunities to do something with these sites that would create revenues for the school. So again, in 2018, the board by resolution declared both, both sites as surplus. And again, that's after that was when our firm was hired to, okay, what is the next step? So here is a timeline that uh, kind of walks through that in a very simple way. And uh, with the arrow being on the other side of 2020 is what are the next steps uh, that the board will wanna take on these two sites? So I mentioned due diligence, and uh, that's one of the things that we pride ourselves on, uh, forensic analysis and due diligence of real estate. Again, it's understanding 
the property better than anybody else does. And the reason for that is that you then can make better decisions. So as part of our due diligence, and this is a very big picture of this, um, is that we met with uh, two groups that were uh, important to, to meet with. Uh, they are representing people in that area, residents in that area, and that's the Redwood Valley MAC group, as well as the Hoplin MAC group. And we met with them multiple times. We also engaged a civil engineer to study and to confirm some of the, the, the constraints and opportunities uh, on both these sites. We research values. We talk to people, we do research, we understand and have a really good idea of what things are worth. And uh, whether that's from a sale or lease, it's important to understand that. We met with the County of Mendocino and uh, I need to mention that both of these sites are in unincorporated Mendocino County. They are not within the incorporated jurisdiction of Ukiah. Uh, we engage a title company because, again, it's important to understand what kind of matters of record impact those properties that may not, you may not be able to see. That, that could be an easement. It could be somebody has a right to do something um, or, or there's something that's clouding that tile, title. And uh, it's important to have that. We got those, uh, those title reports. We also talk to potential users. Uh, once again, it's important to talk to people that are a lot knowledgeable about the local area and values that would be brokers, but it's also important to talk to developers who go through an analysis and uh, they're the ones that end up with skin in the game uh, in terms of having to write checks to do things. And uh, they're the ones that are really gonna determine value when it gets down to determining value. And then one of the other things that we did that was very important was to hire and, and engage an environmental consultant to take a look at both properties. So let's start with Hopland. Um, one of the first things that we discovered was that uh, a portion, actually in the entire Hopland site is within a flood plain. A portion of the site, and I hope and everybody can see this, and it's colored in blue, is a flood way. The two distinct uh, things in FEMA language and in civil engineering language. The flood way is basically an area that is, can, cannot be built in. And uh, I know that you see buildings that are underneath that, and that's portions of the existing Hopland School site. And those, but those were built prior to FEMA redesignating this and a lot of other areas surrounding there as a flood way. The balance of the site, as I mentioned, is in a flood plain. And uh, what a flood plain means is that you can build in a flood plain, but you typically have to be either one or two feet above what is commonly known as a base flood elevation, the BPE. And one of the things that we needed to do was to find out uh, what the elevations were of the existing site, and that would be the ground elevations. And then what are the, what is the existing uh, uh, FEMA certification level? And we have that information. And so sharing that the existing site is, is sloping gently, but it's roughly between 488 and 492 feet above mean sea level. So it slopes five feet plus or minus across the site. So fairly level, fairly flat, but a little bit of rolling. The flood certification level is 499. So on an average, it's somewhere around nine feet above the existing grade. So if somebody were to build something, not in the blue area, but in the balance of the area, they would need to have a finished floor approximately seven plus feet above the existing grade before you could have uh, any kind of a living or uh, other, even if it was a commercial area, you'd have to be there. So there's some real constraints that, that came out of the, uh, this exercise with the civil engineer and understanding what the site was. So this is a fairly big constraint. You'll also see some notes on here, and this is an exhibit that we produced that there, there's some other things uh, on the site which we don't really know about. I don't believe that they're important. Um, there is uh, some access that's being used right now by one of the neighbors, which is not uh, referenced in any documents that I believe the district has, nor of public record. So those need to be addressed also. But again, the takeaway here is to understand what the constraints of this site are, and, and then that's gonna drive what kind of land uses are gonna be appropriate and even feasible 
to be able to put on the property. So when we looked at this, we looked at uh, what, what's the housing demand in the area? What is the zoning? The zoning for the Hopland is suburban residential. It allows residential, it allows other uses also. What are the utilities, wet and dry utilities? Wet being water and sewer, dry being power and gas. What are the environmental constraints or issues with the building? And they're basically are everything that in that particular uh, school uh, was rebuilt and renovated um, sometime in the 2000s. And uh, that so the environmental conditions are actually fairly not benign. Um, what are the flood impacts? We just talked about that. Those are very significant. What are the surrounding landowners and neighbors? Um, and, and again, if you've been there, which I know you all have, uh, their wineries, ag uses, their solar and homes. And then the title, we talked briefly about that also in terms of access, there's very good access to the site from the Ralph Betcher Road and the encroachments. I mentioned that there's some potential encroachments there also that uh, are gonna need to get addressed. So in brief, um, we've estimated the range of values of between 150 and a million dollars. And that, that sounds like a pretty big range. The reason for that is what can you do with it and what are the costs going to be for a developer or somebody coming in, anybody, a user coming in and looking at this. The 150 represents the, the bottom end of the range. That would probably be as an ag use. There are other ag uses out there, whether they're grapes, whether they're grazing. Um, and the upper end of a million dollars is a potential, we believe, for a residential uh, development of some kind. So we also considered a lot of different options when we came up with these values. Uh, and again, that's on the screen. Uh, we talked about lodging. Uh, spa resorts, uh, a, a campground, uh, you know, where people come through. Uh, we looked at, you know, is it feasible for charter or private schools? What about a church or community use? And again, agriculture. The uh, lodging and spa and uh, charter and private school, as well as a church or community use, would still all come under the jurisdiction and land use constraints that would be driven by the FEMA um, in, in the floodway and the flood zone. So we basically don't believe that those are viable options. Um, the KOA campground could be something. Again, that's, that would be an interim or a semi-permanent type use that would not be used all the time. And that might be of some value to look at, but again, it would represent something on the uh, significantly lower end of the economics uh, spectrum for the district. So the, the other option that we did not consider at the direction of the board was any cannabis related uses. So I wanna make sure that uh, everyone is clear on that. So again, the highest potential value we see as being a residential development uh, for that site. So now I'd like to segue into the Redwood Valley site. And we're gonna come back to Hoplin, um, but I wanna give everybody the big picture 20,000 foot view. And what you're looking at right now is about a 20,000 foot view, maybe not that high. So Redwood Valley is a, a little bit bigger site, but a portion of it, as you can see, um, is not usable. Uh, and that's where the Russian river uh, goes through it. And uh, then there's also, in, it represented by the green areas, some significant sloping that goes on. And that's where the contours are. It, it slopes pretty much through the whole site, but those are the fairly uh, steep slopes. And, and as a reference to that, I don't know if you can see um, uh, on the screen that I've got my arrow on, the, uh, on, on one area right here. And that would be, it's kind of going over where it says 3D polygon. And, uh, and so, and just to, the, just to the left of the existing septic field, which is blue. So that area right there is almost a 30 foot separation between where the school is and then where the field is. So again, as you can see, it's not a really long, it's not a wide piece of property, but it's a fairly steep slope right there. So again, all of these things start driving what values are, what you can do with the site, whether it's a school site, whether it's a home site, whatever it happens to be, these are really significant constraints that need to be dealt with. And at the end of the day, 
it really comes back to value. So again, big picture, we looked at housing demand in the area. And, and one of the things, and I'll state this for both Redwood Valley as well as for Hopland, is there's a real need for housing uh, because of the fires and because of all the other things that have gone on, not only in the uh, Mendocino County and Ukiah area, but all over the state. It, when I walked on the site, it, it's a really beautiful site. Um, I mean, you've got views, it's 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 it's, it's very nice site. Um, we look at the potential of reusing the existing buildings. I'll get into that later. Uh, again, we just touched on the topo and one of the, in a to, uh, topographical, I, I, I got to make sure that I use uh, the full words on these. I don't want to lingo everybody uh, to a point where they don't understand what I'm saying. We appreciate that. But, the, but that, but that uh, translates to ADA. And here's another one, American with Disabilities Act. And I think most people are probably familiar with that in terms of what you can do, how you can do things in terms of slopes and providing access to everyone. And again, it's, uh, it's probably pretty easy to understand that if you have very steep slopes that there would be a fairly significant impact to any kind of development, again, whether it was a school or anything else in terms of uh, how do you address those kinds of issues. We also looked at and obtained uh, environmental reports on the buildings because those buildings, which are different than the Hopland uh, buildings, were not renovated. So when the, they were built quite some time ago, and uh, so we wanted to understand what the environmental constraints might be uh, on that, as well as what the impact of the Russian River is, and I'll get to that uh, in a second also. We looked at title and access. Um, we looked at what the surrounding landowners and the neighbors, and it's primarily a residential area right there. Um, the zoning is public facilities, and uh, so any development other than school related type uses um, or uh, you know limited use that's in the zoning code for the county would be permitted without going through a change in the general plan as well as the zoning. And then we looked at utilities uh, and that again would be water and sewer. We looked at wet and dry there uh, and there's no issues with the uh, dry utilities and again that's phone, gas, things like that. Uh, but there are significant uh, things that we're going to be talking about in terms of the wet utilities, which are water and sewer. So let's start with water. We went through, um, and just in way of background, the, this particular property ha is uh, all served from water perspective by the Redwood Valley Water Company. I know a lot of you probably are aware that there's been a lawsuit and, and a settlement on that uh, from quite some time ago that basically precludes the ability for any new connection units in that area for water. So we did a fairly extensive uh, process. We met with the water agency multiple times. We talked to them about different options. As you can see here, I've taken a snapshot of the LACO water report that we commissioned uh, to take a look at making the assumption that there is no new water capacity that is available to that site. What does that mean? And what it means is basically based on pressure. And you can see that in the range of charts. We verified that the pressure is over 60 PSI, pounds per square inch. And what that means is that on that particular property with the existing water that's there that you could support or that what could be supported is about 29 units. And it's, when you look at that, you go, well, it's a one bedroom, one bath and a two bedroom, one bath of the same number of units. And the reason for that is in the water world, it's all based on fixture counts. So in this case, you still have one kitchen and you still have one bathroom. And that is what drives capacity and demand. So that's why you see that. Whereas you go to the three bedroom, two bath, now you've added another bathroom. That's why you have a reduction in the number of units that can be serviced off of the existing water line. And uh, there, there are two water lines that serve the property. They're both two inch meter. Uh, one of them is for domestic, and one of them is for irrigation. Can I interrupt also, for one second? What, um, I, when I was looking at this earlier, I couldn't, I was kept scratching my head. I'm not sure if I didn't read deep enough, but what is F, uh, WSFU? WSFU. 
S F U. It's um, on the chart. We've got fixture yeah. units and just to the right of fixture units. Water, water service fixture units. Did that answer your question? Okay, so it's it's just a tool that you guys use for measuring how many people can live in an area. It, it, it's actually what it is, it's the number, it's an assumption based on, uh, you know, the, the number of really water connections there, water uses, and in this case, bathrooms are the primary, but you have to make the assumption that there's also a kitchen. So what that means, and this is not in a real estate, this isn't a plumbing code, everything is based on fixture units. And don't ask me what uh, one faucet fixture unit is, I just know that there's, you know, there's, there's a toilet, there's a sink, there's a bathtub and or shower, and there's kitchen. And, they, and those together, in that case, make 14.5 water service fixture units. If you add one, I guess we could interpret that, that, that if you add one, it looks like adding one bathroom adds 7.5 fixture units to that count. That's deductive reasoning. That's forensic analysis on the fly. <laughs> So does that answer your question, Tyler? I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it does work. Okay, uh, he's, he's on mute or whatever. So, okay. So um, anyway, the, the, the takeaway on this is with the existing water that's there and, and uh, from a practical point, it does not appear that there's gonna be water capacity that's gonna be available at least in the near term um, to be able to do additional units. Um, that there is a maximum of 29 units that could be, get supported on the entire site. So let's go to the next issue on this, which is septic. Um, in, in this area, there are no municipal uh, sanitary sewer services. So everybody is on their own septic system. And so we, it, again, the district uh, through, through us uh, commissioned LACO to do a study of what the capacity is for existing use as well as for potential future use. To accomplish that, uh, this was actually done last year, all at perk testing and other kinds of testing have to be done during the rainy season. So that, that was all done last year. And uh, this is a map that basically is a summary map that shows an area uh, on, and again, I, I'm not sure if my mouse floating over this as you're seeing it, I don't think probably is, but. You'll see an oh, area. We can see that. We can see that. Oh, you can see my mouse. Okay, so that's that's excellent. So right here. So here's the property line is over here, and this is basically the Russian River. Um, here is a line that is a hundred feet from the top of the bank. This line right here. It within this area. That's a no build for anything. Um, and you just, you can't, it's a, it's a setback. It's a setback for riparian. It's a setback for, and every jurisdiction has this. So it's not just Mendocino County. So in this area here, which is approximately 1.6 acres, a little bit less right here, this is the area that can support a septic field. And, and basically it's going to take the entire thing. And uh, so the re and the reason for that is here on this chart. So there's two different, uh, and, and I, I know there's some technical stuff here, and I'm, I'm going to apologize again in advance, um, but there, there is a, a capacity that septic systems can handle based on the perk of the soil, the percolation of the, of the soil. There's also another layer in terms of who permits the septic system. And if it's under 10,000 gallons a day, and this is statewide, then it can be permitted at the local level, which means at the county. If it's over that, then it has to be permitted through the state. And a, a significantly different process, significantly different um, uh, results and costs that go with both of those. But for the takeaway for now is using our assumption on two bedroom units, and that's the middle column right here, um, and the disposal area, and this is gallons per day. And again, it's a calculation very similar to a fixture count, 
don't ask me what it is. This is an engineering thing. Um, but that's, this is what the, the engineering came up with is that, um, that it can handle 260 gallons per day. And, and then if you look under the limits on the 10,000 gallons, so right here, 10,000 gallons, that would be permitted through the county that it could support, that area could support 38 units. If it was done through the, through the state, it could support, if you went up to 20,000 gallons per day, again, much more comp costly system to put in, you could theoretically support 76 units of two bedrooms. So again, I, it's, it's, it's important to understand the concept. Um, again, a lot of numbers there, and uh, these are engineers, but uh, we've dealt with this a lot and, uh, and it all makes sense. So, so what does that mean? Scott, um, when, I'm, I'm sorry, can you back up two slides how much do we want to do this now versus after the presentation? I can hold off if you'd like. Do you need it to understand what he's saying right now? Um, for the Redwood, let me throw this out there. It could be a moot point and, okay. and you guys throw tell me. Uh, there are riparian rights that some people that live next to rivers can use. I'm wondering if that's something that Scott and his crew uh, have assessed to make sure we can maximize the number of units on this. I don't know if it applies to um, uh, drinking water for apartments and, and housing. And we have another property, RBEOP, across the highway. I'm also wondering if it's a possibility to sell our water rights that's on that piece of property to this to increase the value um, to, to make this a, uh, a more viable site? It is the answer, yes, we looked at it or no, we looked at it, uh, Scott, because otherwise we should um, take it at the end. Yes, we did look at it and I'm actually going to get to that a little bit later. Okay, thank you. So I, 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 we, we do know the answer to this because those are very good questions and we asked those quite some time ago. So we do have those uh, that we can share with you. But let, if, if you're okay, if we can uh, keep going and we'll get to that. Yes. You, you made me feel good by complimenting me. I'm, I'm okay for anything. Now we know. <laughs> That's what we do with Trustee Nelson. We want to make sure that everybody's questions, not only from the board, but also from the community are answered. Because again, it's important in order to make good decisions to have good information. Indeed. So again, in terms of the opportunities, uh, we, we, the op options that we considered are again, very similar to the Redwood Valley site. We looked at church, um, private school, community use, public school, charter schools, residential, lodging, um, you know, all of those things. Uh, again, all the, the commercial type would require a zone change. Things like a, a school would probably not. Um, but, and then again, the options that we did not consider uh, were the cannabis related uses. And uh, again, like in Hopland, we came up, our assessment is the highest and best use of that property. It's for residential and the range of value is somewhere between 750 and a million dollars. And the reason why that range is tighter is that we're not looking at ag type values. So on Hopland, if you'll remember, we, it was a fairly large range but again, that was based on two very different land uses and what uh, somebody could pay for land for ag is significantly less than what they could pay for something like housing. So our recommendations to the board to consider are to market the Hopland property um, for exchange, not for sale. Um, identify users and or developers uh, for housing development. And then the follow-up would be to research options for an exchange to acquire another property for district use using the value of the Hopland property. And I'm gonna get into that in a, couple, in a minute also. So currently the district is negotiating with a developer to acquire the Hopland property as part of an exchange. Uh, the proposed use is housing and the estimated time we hope to be able to bring a, an agreement for the board to consider is at, uh, in May or June. 
And uh, that could change based on COVID-19, based on a lot of things that none of us have any control over in terms of uh, what's going on in our world today. So Redwood Valley is going to be, again, very similar recommendations that the, the property is marketed for exchange uh, for another property for district use, that we identify either a user or a developer for that for a housing project, um, that there's going to be continuing ongoing work with the water district on additional capacity if that's available, and then potentially when. And then work with that uh, selected developer to rezone the property to allow you such as housing to happen. And that would also be the stakeholders who are the Redwood Valley Mac, as well as uh, other uh, people that are in that area. And again, the last part of that is to identify, work on an, and identify a property as an up leg. And that's a, a term that I'd like. There's a down leg and an up leg in exchanges. And the, the down leg would be, in this case, Redwood Valley, the up leg would be what the district, if they went through this process, would acquire uh, with the proceeds from the, this particular site. Again, the current status of this project, project and this property is that uh, the district is negotiating with the developer to acquire this property, again, as part of an exchange. The proposed use would be housing. And again, the estimated time, and I you underlined the word estimated, is to bring an exchange agreement to the board sometime in June or July for their consideration, for your consideration. So let me talk a little bit about the exchange process. Um, so the exchange process is um, the district's made, and in, in, in rightfully so in our opinion, the right tool if you're going to do something with these properties to not sell them. First of all, selling property as a school district is a very long and painful process. Second of all, you get rid of an asset that you may need at some time in the future. And whether that asset is another property or it's a ground lease that you can then trade into another property, it's important not to lose the asset value of what you have. Um, the district, again, has identified a potential exchange partner for both of these sites. And at the process uh, of this would be to try to match up values as close as we can. So if the value of the, the Hopland property is a million dollars, and I'm just using that as an example, that the upleg of that property would be want to be as close to a million dollars as we could get. If it was less, there would be proceeds that would uh, go to the district. If it was more, it would be the district would need to write a check to balance that uh, difference out. Uh, but as long as it's close, uh, that, that's the important thing. So then uh, one of the things that we're going to ask the board in the future, if they move forward with this, is, okay, what kind of upleg or new property do you need? Do you need something that would be for school-related uses? And that could be for corporation yard, could be for a future school site, something that the district would use. The option or alternate option on that would be, okay, well, it could be for something else. You could acquire a property, an income producing property, and something that would generate revenue uh, to the district, and that revenue would be general fund revenue. You, uh, the nice thing about that is that you have an asset and you also have current income coming in. So those are the two options that, that in the future will, if this process moves forward, we'll be asking the, uh, the board about their thoughts on that. So again, the district identifies a property. This is, a, this is the really good Reader's Digest version of how an exchange works. The, the district identifies a property. Uh, the district exchange partner, the, one, the person that wants the district property, acquires that property that the district wants and then trades that um, to the district. So there's a, there's a buyer, there's a seller, and then there's money. That's basically how it works. And then the next chart is, again, you know, day one or the day that you uh, have the property and you're ready to do, the, the, the district has a property, uh, buyer has money, wants your property, and you got a third property that's for sale. At the end, after all that happens, the district has the third party's property. The buyer exchange partner has the school property and the guy at the end, uh, the third party, he's got the money. So it's always follow the money. 
And so this is hopefully a good pictorial representation of how an exchange works, which is significantly different than a sale. I, mean, I think most people are gonna be familiar with a sale. I have something, I will sell it to you, you give me money and I give you my property. Again, school districts is, is not that easy to be able to do those kinds of things uh, in the ed code. So let me get to the executive summary here for Hopwin. Um, so again, I, I'm telling you what we told you and I'm gonna tell you again. Um, the floodplain is a really significant issue. And uh, we've checked and the district has also that uh, it would be uh, impossible to obtain insurance and that would apply to whether it was a school district, a charter school, a private school, you could not get flood insurance in an area that was a flood zone. You can in a floodplain, but again, remember that that involves raising finished floor uh, for whatever was built up probably seven to nine feet. The other potential significant legal exposure is opening something that is a public gathering place and then having a flood that would come through in an identified area. Again, those are things that we would like the board to consider as they make their uh, decisions and deliberations. Also in this area, the district enrollment is, is uh, as we, the information that we have is less than 100 students. One of the things that, that we see in our school practice, uh, and we do work for about 35 different school districts throughout the state of California, is that under the typical funding formula that the state has, um, and it varies from district to district, whether you're a basic aid or uh, not a basic aid, um, is that the typical new school needs to be about 500 students in order for it to operate and not operate in the red. So that's something that uh, is important to understand. Um, the legal constraints to selling, I mentioned that before, are significant. There's a very significant process. It typically takes uh, anywhere up to two years um, to go through that process. You have to offer the property to uh, other agencies, uh, they can acquire the property, depending on the status of that property, it could be for significantly less than market rate, um, all the way up to 25% um, of what the district acquired the property for. And that could be almost next to nothing. But school districts can exchange their property. And that's a fairly straightforward, easy process, um, relatively easy. Uh, process in the uh, California Education Code. It takes a two-thirds vote of the Board of Trustees in order to make that determination. Um, but the significant thing from our perspective and what we advise our clients on, again, don't get rid of your assets. You may need them in some way, shape, or form in the future. And it's important to do that and to have that uh, asset at some time when you do need it. So, if the, if the district uh, chooses to go forward and chooses to do an income producing property, those accomplishes a couple of things. It accomplishes the fact that you no longer have to maintain the site that you have now. It also uh, pre, you know, puts an asset to use and, and uh, there's a return that comes off of that that is general fund revenue. Okay? You use it the discretion and direction of the board. So the Redwood Valley site, uh, again, uh, going back, if you remember uh, on the map that I had showing the topography in a big picture sense with the changes in grade, our opinion is, is that uh, it would be cost prohibitive to make that a campus under whether it was a private school, public school, charter school, it would be impossible to make that campus ADA compliant without unbelievable amounts of money, um, uh, you know, thrown at it. And uh, so we, and that's a federal law. That's something that, uh, you know, that the district doesn't control, nor can they get out of. So the new septic, um, and, and again, trustee Tyler, the, 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 to answer that, um, the leach field or the area that I showed you, the 1.58 acres uh, that uh, we identified as the area where the leach field is, um, that would need to be, if the school was to be put back in operation as a school, you, you would not be able to use your existing septic system. And the reason for that is a portion of that septic system is actually underneath your, or your leach field is actually underneath the tennis courts. 
So it is non-compliant in pretty much every way that uh, you can be non-compliant in. So that would involve using most of that area right up to that buffer line, that 100 foot setback from the, the, the top of the creek, that area you cannot encroach into for development or for anything like this, such as a septic or leach field. So that's real important to understand that, uh, you know, going back and let me, let me go back to that map because I think it's important to look at that. Sorry for the uh, flip through here. So right here. Um, so again, this line represents the 100 foot setback. Nothing can get built or developed in here. Uh, you might be able to do some fields or something like that or a, a PARS course, but no physical development. And again, that would include septic. Within this area here, this 1.58 acres, this is the area that is the basis for the LACO report that said you're gonna need this area here in order to serve either 29 lots or a school. Um, and then going back a couple further, and, and uh, again, I, this is an important thing to understand. And I know we looked at it before, but this area here, the blue area, that is your existing septic leach field. And you can see a portion of that, um, maybe a third, something like that, 30%, is actually underneath the tennis courts. And that uh, is something that would be very hard to, to do today. In fact, it'd be impossible to do today. So that those things are important from that. And again, I'm apologizing. I don't wanna give anybody whiplash here, but I wanna, do wanna go back to the, um, the slide that we were on. Did that address your question, Trustee Nelson? It didn't. Um, I appreciate the septic constraints. Um, access, but the biggest constraint to this of the potential projects here is water, drinking water, or water to wash your clothes, or however you want to look at it. And there are so right now it's piped in from Redwood Valley. Who I can't remember the name of the water district. Redwood Valley Water District. Uh, okay. I'm almost a genius tonight. Um, what the the question that I had is in um, the ag community, if you're parked next to a river, uh, that particular parcel can utilize something called riparian rights. And I don't know, of course, the, the water that's pulled from the Russian River would have to be um, processed so it's safe. But I'm wondering if that is a, a right that you had a chance to examine? We did, you have none um, it, it, through that whole area there. The other issue, and I wanted to bring that up also in terms of the utilities, and, and you're absolutely right, the knot hole for the development of this property is water. And when I say that, that's the real significant constraint. You can see that septic can be addressed. There's area and room to be able to do that. There's a cost associated with it, but it's possible. For water, it's completely different. So we looked at not only, okay, the existing capacity that you have, and remember, uh, you know, whether it's um, a new development, uh, you know, especially in a new development, you have three different sources of water that you typically need. You need domestic. And so the domestic water would be what you flush your toilets with, what you wash your dishes with, what you cook with, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the landscape water, which is usually non-potable and less expensive, and there's a lot of jurisdictions and agencies that are going to that because it's, it's, uh, it's treated, but it's not treated to the same level as uh, domestic water. So therefore, it's more cost effective and all of that. The other one that's really important is that everything now needs to be fire sprinkler. So you've got to look at all three of those in terms of the water demands on that. And again, we've addressed that in those 29 units. We were able to calculate and use that, um, uh, you know, all three of those needs using those, those uh, two sources of water. But the school also has a well on the site. There's also a well on the Pinecrest site, and that's down the road. We looked at those. Um, in, in terms of, you know, what can you do with it? And there's two issues. Um, the first issue is, and we talked to the water district, 
about selling the rights and transferring those rights to be able to get more domestic water because you have to have treated water for domestic. And, uh, and Redwood Valley, and we talked to their legal counsel as well as the board, and there, are, they, there is no way to be, no mechanism to be able to do that at this time until the litigation is settled or gone away. Some of that might change because they're talking about going through and consolidating and merging some of these water districts. That may free up some additional connections because some areas that, like the Potter Valley water, some of the others have some existing capacity, but Redwood Valley does not. So the, the, the issue with that, because we thought that would be an elegant way of solving that, is we'll sell you the water rights coming off of both the well and, uh, and as well as the Pinecrest, um, and, and, uh, but they can't do that. For the district or for an ultimate developer to be able to use that water, it, the only thing it could use it for is non-potable. You could not use that for domestic purposes because it's not treated. And frankly, nobody wants to get into whether it's a district or a developer into the municipal water treatment business. That's expensive and uh, there's not enough units that you would be able to put on this to even come close to justifying that. So does that answer your question in terms of water? Oh, and no, and I mentioned no riparian rights either. We looked at that. In fact, there's not a lot of people have riparian rights on that. And we're familiar with that because we do other work in areas where there's uh, uh, 1913 water rights um, pre and post. And uh, there's all different kinds of things that go along with that. But there are no riparian rights. You have no right to pull water out of the Russian river. I think that stinks. And I wish you would change that for us. We'll look into that for you. <laughs> so anyway, um, to, but so to answer your question, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Scott. Thank you. Okay, good. Just wanted to make sure of that. So the next thing that we, you know, in terms of the, uh, this executive summary, I, I mentioned the environmental cleanup. We did have the company go in and do an environmental assessment of what uh, any remediation was and might be. We do have that. There, there are things that you would see in older facilities, such as lead-based paint and, and some asbestos and things like that. Um, again, those can be addressed and dealt with. We did not look at things like mold because that would be something if you were to tear the buildings down as a non-issue. If you were to try to reuse them, that would be another level of testing. We didn't go to that level. Uh, because frankly, that changes a lot uh, over time. So we felt that it was more important to deal and understand what the uh, in-place issues were that were not going to change. So what we did was we looked at that in, you know, in terms of the cleanup cost and in terms of all of that and, and reopening part of that. Uh, and, and we felt that that was a non-starter for anybody, whether it was the school district, the Ohio school district, the charter school, private school, or whatever, um, without going through all of, uh, of those things, which again would be cost prohibitive. So that with the existing water capacity, um, that I know there's been in our discussions with the Redwood Valley Mac that they would like to have some kind of a community center um, and and or the you know the use of the multi-purpose room again the 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 issues with that are what I brought up with there's no water capacity for that so if if you were to leave the community center there in place there would be ADA issues to address to get to it. Uh, there would be environmental cleanup issues to address to be able to use it. And it would take away from the number of units that you would get um, or be able to construct on the property because that would pull away. So you may, uh, depending on what, uh, we, we didn't do a capacity on that particular building, but it could cut the number of units almost in half, which then makes that not as much of a viable uh, project for somebody to do with all of the things that they'd have to do. So, because there's demolition, uh, you know, on top of all of that. So the existing system, a septic system, uh, you, you can't handle that with the current county or state requirements as, you, as I pointed out. Uh, and again, the district enrollment as we understand it is being accommodated uh, with additional capacity available in that area for schools for the district. And uh, again, not to beat the dead horse, but uh, you know, the, the constraints to selling public schools always steer us towards either ground leases or exchanges. 
And, uh, and our, our, again, recommendation uh, in this particular case is for an exchange. So what our thoughts are in terms of wrapping this up from our perspective um, is that the district uh, and the conversations that we've had and, and uh, what we've come up with is responsibly addressing actually way more than many districts that we do work with uh, for the, through the, not only the public process with having two 7-Eleven committees over that 10 year time frame, uh, but in also understanding and being open and receptive to what the economics are of maintaining closed school sites. What, the, what, a, what are the market issues that a developer is going to be looking at? And that has to do with the physical constraints, legal constraints uh, of any particular piece of property. And uh, we've walked through most of those this evening. And, uh, you know, and, and also with the district's goal, and I know this, uh, you know, of looking at, you know, the short and long-term needs to house and educate students, which is your mission. And uh, also the, um, overlaying that with the ability, potential ability to provide much needed housing in the area to replace some of the fire damaged housing and fire destroyed housing. And, uh, and then acting responsibly to manage a really core asset that, uh, that Ukiah Unified has, which is land for the greater benefit of the community and the district. So with that, um, I am done with our presentation. I hope that uh, I didn't make anybody go to sleep. And uh, there's a test later because this is a school district and uh, we're gonna wanna see how many people remembered all of these great esoteric concepts. So Thank Madam you. President, it's back to you. Thank you very much, Scott. That was great, fine overview for us to get us all remembering the concepts and back up to speed on the latest developments on this project. Um, now we're going to turn to public comment could the superintendent or the executive secretary let us know how many public comments have been received? We have received a total of 14. 14 public comments. So if each comment were three minutes, then that would be 42 um, minutes of public comment. So what we would do, is in a um, abundance of transparency is we would ask them to be read aloud to us. Does the board have an objection to 42 minutes of public comment or would they prefer to just read up until 30 minutes and, um, and then have the rest uh, sent to us? They will all be sent to us regardless. Board weigh in. Tr Trustee, Mulgard, Trustee Mulgard, why do we think it's gonna be 42 minutes long? Well, we were just, our directions on the form were, if you were here in person, you'd be making a three minute public comment. So we're gonna read for three minutes. That's how, that's how that came up. But are people, are the comments like a couple sentences long or are they like three minutes long? We, any, do the, uh, the staff reading the comments, do you have any idea how long they are? Do they look like they're taking the full 350 um, words, or do they look, some of them look shorter? Some appear to be a little bit shorter and others are lengthy. Okay, okay. I am, um, uh, I would like to start with the 30 minutes um, and let's grind through it. I think it's really important to hear what our um, community is saying. And it, when we hit the 30 minute mark, let's assess where we're at, if is what I would suggest. Okay. I like that. I like that. Who, said, who said that? Was that B? It was B. Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, is there any objections to that? Otherwise we'll proceed with that. All right, so it's um, 7.08 right now. We will go until 7.38 and then see how much more we have. And um, we want to be very clear every time um, you start a new comment, if you could say this is a public comment, just to make sure that somebody tuning in on YouTube doesn't accidentally think this is your opinion or this is the district's opinion. Um, so with that being said, uh, let us... Uh, 
let us hear our public comments. And thank you to the people who took the time to uh, write in and share their thoughts. Thank you, President Molgard, Deb Cuban, Superintendent, um, our executive ass assistant, and I will be reading these. And um, I'm just gonna read a statement. We're both gonna read a statement prior to each one, just in case people are tuning in partway through. But the following public comment was received by the district using the telecommuting public comment form. For ease of public participation, we're going to read it into the record. Executive Assistant Ornelas and I will be doing that. This should not be construed as an endorsement of this comment by the district or as the position of the district. The first comment we received was from John Bartlett and it reads as this, the sale or transfer of the Hopland School. The Hopland School is in the floodplain and has flooded several times in the past years. Any building or use of that area will need to be raised out of the floodplain, which will cause all of the houses in the area to flood. And that was the end of the, the comment. Thank Executive you. Assistant Ornelas. Okay, the following public comment was received by the district using the telecommuting public comment form. For ease of public participation, it will be read into the record by me, Executive Assistant. This should not be construed as an endorsement of this comment by the district or as the position of the district. This comment was submitted by Michelle Dorn. As a resident who would be directly affected by Gary Breen's low income housing project at the Hopland Elementary School site, I do not give my permission for Ukiah Unified School District to allow that land to be used for that purpose. I have not talked to one neighbor who supports this and there was a clear and unanimous answer no when this was proposed at the Hopman meeting. People who have had business dealings with Mr. Breen have been unimpressed by his business ethics and believe he does not have the community's best interest in mind. I would much rather the land be used as a community center and or community gardens, which may be possible to achieve through state grant funds and community participation, which I would be glad to head up. Upon buying our home, we understood that the property that Hopland Elementary sits on was donated under the agreement that it would remain a school. To violate that agreement with an idea, an idea so opposing to its intention would be obscene. Say no thank you to the proposed low-income housing. President Mulgard? Yes. I I'm, have a sneaking suspicion that uh, because this style of meeting is very new to us, uh, maybe to all the United States, um, is it critically necessary to have the statement before the public comment is read? That was going to be getting a little tiresome, was it not? Um, however, I think that the reason we're so concerned is because we have staff people reading it and we just don't want people who are coming in the middle to not understand it. Um, maybe our council could weigh in, Aaron. Yes, if I just wanted to start with this is a public comment, I think that would address and clarify for any of the public watching that this is not a district position. Okay, thank you. This is a public comment. Hopland School, my name is Mitch Franklin. I am a Hopland resident and a former student at the Hopland School. I have two kids under years old that should be attending the Hopland School in the near future. I urge the Ukiah Unified School Board to postpone any discussion about the Hopland School until the COVID-19 virus has passed so all of the Hopland community can attend your meeting in person and give public comment and attempt to convince you to not allow our school to be traded or sold. I am the fire chief for the Hopland Fire Protection District and I can assure you that Hopland is starting to grow and you will see an increase in new housing over the next couple of years and Hopland will need a school. Please postpone this discussion until the COVID-19 virus has passed. Thank you. This is a public comment submitted by Beth Salkin. 
My first concern is this. I have never met Gary Breen, the man named in buying the Hopland School, but in the half a dozen times his name has been brought up in conversation by different Hopland residents, the only word associated with him by all of them is liar. Earlier in the month, Gary was asked what his involvement in the purchase and low income housing development was, and he stated, it's not me. Now there it is, the truth, it is him. I find it disturbing that the UUSD would hold a poorly advertised special meeting when the state is on a shelter in place ordered by the governor and the world is in a pandemic. This paints the UUSD in a bad light as if it is being secretively set up in a telecommuting meeting where we cannot debate nor rebuttal, only give comments and concerns. This is not acceptable and should be tabled for a real meeting that people can attend in light of the current world status. Secondly, with the low income housing statistically crime and call for service for law enforcement will raise. Will Gary be paying monies toward a resident Hoffman deputy from the MCSO? In the four years I have lived here, I have yet to see a deputy in our town. They are spread thin as it is. Thirdly and lastly, there are not a lot of local jobs in Hoffman, leaving this group of renters commuting to work. The carbon footprint that will be raised considerably. This is not the location for a large low income housing development per job availability. This is a public comment. Ukiah Unified Properties in Hopland and Redwood Valley. Good afternoon. And this is from Nick, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced the last name, Mertes, M-E-R-T-E-S. Good afternoon. It has been brought to my attention that the sale or trade of the unoccupied school site in Hopland is up for discussion. It is my hope that the proposed use of this property is one that benefits the community and does not create a negative impact for the surrounding neighborhood or infrastructure of our small town. Unfortunately, word has spread that the site is being considered for a low income housing development. As a neighbor of the school, the impact of this decision is troublesome. Issues ranging from lack of parking and services to low presence of law enforcement and probable increase in crime are of major concern to the residents surrounding the school. It also has to be said that the decision to hold this special board meeting during the current shelter in place order has a distinct air of deception. As a community member, my knowledge of this meeting happened by chance perhaps further effort should be put forth to make people aware of the decisions that need their input. Mailers, phone notifications, bulletins at the post office, et cetera. Thank you for your consideration. This is a public comment. There is no name submitted. Since the MCSO has used the facility and the electricity and lights were on when I visited, who is paying those utilities? This is a public comment. Good evening, and this is from Eric Salkin. Good evening, my wife and I own our home behind the Hopland Elementary School. It has come to our attention that a potential buyer would like to acquire this property and build low income condos or other such dwellings. We have begun the process of gathering our neighbors, so far 36 of them, who are directly impacted to, to form our own group and pool our resources to hire an attorney. We will not allow our neighborhood and lives to become impacted in this way. I can list many negative reasons why this is a bad idea. We are not people without resources. We care deeply for our neighborhood and are close knit. In fairness, we understand why the district would want to transfer the property and garner an income from it. Please take into consideration and respect our rights as well. We pay high taxes, vote for our current county elected officials and are ready to take action. This is a public comment submitted by John Bartlett. The meeting should be postponed till it can be done in a live format. This way all can express their concerns in person and explain their concern more accurately. We need more. President Mulgard, my hands are empty. We do not have any more. 
Okay, so it took less time. You have oh, one. Deb, sorry, Go ahead. excuse me, executive okay. assistant Ornelas has more. Has more. This is a public comment submitted by Deborah Bradford. Copland School is on a floodplain, has had water in the classrooms multiple times. It is not a good site for low income housing. Another issue is that there is no grocery store in town and bus service is very low. I went to Hopland School and I and still think it would be good for Hopland to have our school again. When it was closed down, it took the heart out of this town. Children from Hopland have long bus rides back and forth and to and from Ukiah. This is a public comment submitted by Christy Mertes, M-E-R-T-E-S. I live down the street from the Hopland Elementary School and have been there for over 16 years. I am not happy with the potential decision to sell the property for low income housing. I know what kind of neighborhood it will become and we don't have the law enforcement to deal with the issues that will happen. Does the town have a plan for law enforcement to balance this type of development? We have enough problems with transients due to the cannabis workers. The infrastructure to support a development like this is not in place. Also, this property floods. What's the plan for that? I also think that the district doing this meeting during a shelter in place is very sneaky and shady. From my understanding, this has been an ongoing issue for quite a while. What is a couple more months to wait? The town people should be able to be heard and not just on a Google doc where we can't rebuttal your answer. Plus none of our neighbors who share a fence line with the school even knew about this meeting. Thank goodness at least one neighbor did and shared it with the street. Shame on the district for not putting more effort out to the neighbors. Again, shady. This is a public comment submitted by Anna Louise Coles. K-O-H-L-S. Thank goodness for community, otherwise I would not have heard of this meeting. I want to start with why I don't believe building low income housing would be good. One, I work in education. I find it inconceivable that children are bused one hour to and from school then are expected to do homework. They are exhausted once they get to school and yet you are willing to put more children at risk for learning. Two, there is no supermarket in Hopland and a bus that runs once slash twice a day to Ukiah. Really? Three, there are no services, mental health or medical, not to mention the lack of police support. The person in question of buying the property does not have others in mind, only his pockets. Not well respected by the community. I moved here because I believe in the Mendocino community and I hope UUSD is thinking of community. I already pay large tax amount. I will be disappointed if this goes through. This is a public comment submitted by Alex DeGrassi. Is there an investor interested in the RV site? This is a public comment submitted by Julie Golden. Hello, my name is Julie Golden, property and business owner in Mendocino County since 1997, in Hopland since 2000. I was born and raised in Mendocino County and attended K-12 in UUSD. I am also the chair of the Hopland Municipal Advisory Council, which I formed in 2015. I request to present this comment in person and believe I have the right under the Brown Act to submit more than 365 words. I believe the 7-Eleven committee has violated the Brown Act twice, once in 2008, 2009, and again during the period 2017, 2018. As a property owner and parent of four children born 1998 through 2003, I was not notified that there were community meetings in 2008 or 2018 intended to gather community input on the need for a school in Hopland. 
Article 1.5, Advisory Committees 17390, Section C, requires the district to C, cause to have circulated throughout the attendance area a priority list of surplus space and real property and provide for hearings of community input to the committee on acceptable uses of space and real property, including the sale or lease of surplus real property for child care development purposes pursuant to section 17458. You and your agents have not complied with this require, requirement and the requirement for disposition of allegedly surplus lands and you cannot act into, until you do so comply. If you insist on selling or exchanging the property, we insist as the community that our needs for a local school are met as part of the development conditions. These considerations would be considered if the district complied with the California Environmental Quality Act. The alleged environmental restraints are overstated and false. For one thing, the representations as to the floodplain are erroneous as determined by civil engineer Franz. To the extent that your proposed action is driven by a desire to monetize property held for the purpose of educating students and to facilitate a housing development, we believe you need to prepare an environmental impact report to address the document and the alleged environmental baseline, the impact impacts of the proposed housing project and to address the loss of the ability to provide a site for siting a Hopland school. I believe that is all the public comment that I have received to at this time. Thank you. Okay, so um, just because I'll probably say it three more times before the end of the meeting, this is a meeting to share information so that we know what's going on with the project that we have hired Terra Realty to do. This is not a vote. There's no vote happening tonight. There was never planned on being a vote happening tonight. Um, that would be sometime in the future. We don't know when, and I'm sure it will be delayed by COVID-19, but I just wanna make sure that everybody knows that, uh, that there was never a plan to have this be a vote. It was just for moving our, uh, the board along in becoming informed about the topic. Uh, questions from the board for Terra Realty or for staff? Uh, Trustee Nelson. That hand thing works pretty good. Um, thank you for the tip on how to use it. Um, I Public comment is uh, sitting on the dais or behind the cameras right now is always something that's really strange. Um, we heard lots of comments tonight asking to rebut uh, what we might be talking about. Um, I think it's really important to remind the public that we're here to listen to what they have to say. And then the discussion um, takes place internally um, in front of the public um, about what we as, as board members um, uh, are feeling about particular things that we're talking about in public. Um, we can consult with staff uh, while, while we're making those decisions, but it's whether it's in person or in camera, or we're listening to emails, which we free, frequently get, it's a very strange time because opening that dialogue back and forth between the public is just something that is, um, it, it, it doesn't work uh, and, and we don't practice it. Um, so I just want to say, I appreciate so much that we have had input on this. Um, I, I know that, um, that for my community in Hopland and for the Redwood Valley folks, um, that the, the schools are something that feel as if they're uh, sacred grounds being a proud Hopland bear, I really appreciate that. Um, uh, we're listening. Thank you. Trustee Van Sant. Thank you. I can't figure out the little, if there's some other kind of hand other than your real hand, I, I don't know how to do that. Um, I had, let's see, I had, 
two thoughts. One, I, um, I, the, I appreciate the public comment and that people submitted that public comment. In some ways it was actually easier to have it read. Um, I think that was actually really helpful. So I really appreciate all the um, commenters who did submit comments. And um, I just wanna echo what President Mulgaard said that this is not a time that we're taking a vote. So it is really helpful to see the whole picture of the presentation and have the public comments at the same time. Um, that being said, I, I did want to ask a question that is somewhat off topic, but a little bit related to the comments. And maybe this is to Scott. Um, you know, we, we began this conversation about these properties before the pandemic hit, and we're in a totally different world right now. And I'm just wondering how you think that that, that change of circumstances may impact interested developers or the project itself. It does seem like we're in a very different environment. And I, I just don't know, is the project, are these are these properties even appealing anymore in the new climate that we're in? And, and are we actually, should we actually be having a different discussion or are the same kinds of developers that were interested in before, do you think they're still interested? Well, I, I'll try to answer that question in, in, and I'd be speculating a little bit, um, but, the one thing that I do understand is that the fundamentals for housing demand is not going away. It may be temporarily suspended, but it's not going away. Things are going to happen in the short term, uh, and, then, and they may be different in the long term. But uh, I believe that there, you know, to the ex extent that a developer can do something to make money and, uh, and, and respect the needs of the community, which I think is always important. Um, that there are there is and will be interest in those sites. Thank in, you for in, keeping that to be a very general answer. Since, um, as I'm sure you're aware, Trustee Van Sant, negotiations themselves are confidential because if we, as a public entity, were discussing who was bidding on what, um, we would never get a very good deal. So, um, so in general, but we appreciate the fact that that you shared your opinion. Um, does staff have anything else to add to that? And then we'll go to Trustee Arkin. Okay, Trustee Arkin, your your question. Uh, well, it's more a statement than a question. Sure. Uh, I too appreciate uh, that we're getting these uh, kinds of notes and get uh, input from the community. But I've noticed um, with quite a few of them, there's a misunderstanding that our meeting was set in secret. This meeting, uh, I really would like our community to know that this meeting was set way before all of this bad stuff that's happening. And we were planning on having it uh, as it, this is this way, uh, an open meeting, and certainly not this way. So I don't want people to misunderstand that, that we were trying to sneak around. I'm very happy that we were able to do this meeting, at least to start getting it out. That's it. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us of that. Superintendent Cuban and then Mr. Berrickman. And just as a reminder, in 2018, through uh, a public process and a public hearing, the board did take action to surplus both of these properties. And I know Scott uh, from Terra Realty reviewed that, but I just want to remind everybody that we had a significant process with the 7-Eleven committee who came to you with a recommendation and you, the board took action to surplus the properties. And there was significant public um, interest and participation in that process, including people from the community, in addition to staff and board members who sat on those both those 7-Eleven committees. Mr. Berrickman? I was going to basically say the exact same things that we're recapping decisions that have already been made that have already been vetted through public processes for many years by uh, the board. So a lot of this is not new or should not be new. And I also want to remind everyone and perhaps Scott or Aaron can chime in a little bit that before any kind of development would be done, once the properties exchange hands before any kind of development would be done would be a whole other entire public process. It's not, we're not making the decision to put any kind of development in any of these properties. We're just looking to find an exchange partner for these properties. Any follow-up on that? 
Sure, I, I can respond to that in terms of confirming um, any kind of development that would happen, whether it was on the, the Hopland or the Redwood Valley or frankly any other site has to go through uh, a process uh, you know, that is completely community. It would be through the local agency, in this case, the county. It would involve CEQA, which is uh, California Environmental Quality Act. Uh, there would be uh, lots of opportunities for the public and interested stakeholders to be able to weigh in on that uh, during that process. But that's not something that the district would do. I echo what uh, Steve just said, that that's something that a developer would do and go through that process um, with, with the, to, for whatever his program was. So yes, to echo that. Trustee Nelson. Um, uh, the two gentlemen that preceded me took the words out of my mouth. Um, I'm gonna. Okay. I had a question of something that I hadn't heard before. Um, and that was how did the school district acquire the Hopland school property? Was it gifted to us? Was it in any sort of a trust that had any kind of conditions or conditions that run with the land or anything like that? And, and if you don't know the answer off the top of your head, I completely understand, but that would just be something I would want to be able to see in the future. So we did, as I mentioned, uh, get a preliminary title report along with the chain of title vesting uh, in the property and the property was I don't remember if it was how it was acquired and when it was required acquired, but there was some uh, 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 community members that came up and thought that there was a reversionary interest. And again, that's not something that's completely atypical in schools in our practice to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas if you continue not using that as something, then in, it can go back to whoever the, uh, the, that chain of title, whoever that happens to be. In this particular instance, no, there is none. It was uh, acquired, uh, you know, and, and there are no reversionary interests in that. And uh, we talked to the Redwood Valley Mac about that and, uh, and showed them the documents and uh, they seemed to be satisfied with that. And that was true for both properties? There was nothing in the Hopland at all. There was no re reversionary interest in the deeds, uh, no nothing in that either. So again, we Trace that back all the way to when the school acquired or the district acquired the title, and there's nothing in any document that says anything to that. And again, that's that's why you record these things. So there, you know, a lot of times, and we've had stuff uh, we do work, and you know, there's documents and deeds that trace trace back to the 1800s, and we've looked at those. Uh, we do have we did have one that was uh, that was back in 1913, 1918, and it was $10 in gold coin, and if they, they decided not to use it. Um, that they got it back and they got it back. But in this case, there's nothing on either one of those sites. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Yes. Um, our community member, Julie Golden, made a couple of claims that we were um, three, two or three, three or four claims that we were doing things illegally. I'm not sure. Um, um, Deb, how we address those, but um, I think it's important that we take a look at those and make sure that we're um, doing things with our, the, um, um, not clarity, the transparency uh, that you've led the district in. In um, I think it's important that we address those issues uh, as much as, as we need to. So if we could look into those to make sure that we're on the up and up. I think that'd be very important for the, the community as a whole, and especially for us sitting on the board. Yes, Trustee Nelson, we're happy to have legal counsel review our process. However, it would surprise me that there would be a problem from 08, 09, or 017, or 018 that had not been brought to our attention previously. So. Um, and as somebody who worked for three years in order to get our board meetings on YouTube in real time, um, believe me, I am very committed to transparency and public participation. We appreciate the public comment that we received, as other trustees have said. Um, it will be forwarded in writing to each of the board members and will become part of the record. So if you happen to submit after the reading was already done, we will be receiving that public comment as well. Um, 
want to let people know that on our website, which is at www.uusd.net, you can see the schedule of all the meetings. The next two regularly scheduled meetings are May 14th and June 11th. They are usually on the second Thursday of the month. There are often extra meetings during June for um, fiscal things to close up the fiscal year and to plan the next fiscal year. I don't know that this particular topic will be on either the May 14th or the June 11th meetings, but I just wanted to put those dates out there so that people are aware that those are the next two um, regularly scheduled school board meetings. Superintendent Cuban and then Trustee Van Sant. I just also wanted to remind the board that we do have a meeting in April um, and Executive Assistant Ornelas has that date, but it is the Thursday after spring break. I can't remember the date off the top of my head, but we do have one in April. Very true. I didn't even mention it because I knew that we wouldn't cover this topic at that meeting. But of course, you are welcome to come to the public and make a comment on agenda items that are not on that particular agenda. So you could address this indeed at the at the April meeting as well. Thank April you. meeting will be held on April 16th. April 16th, May 14th, June 11th are the upcoming meetings. Trustee Van Sant. Um, you may have already gone through this and I just, just for the benefit of the public and frankly myself, um, the next step, we're not voting on anything today. We're just listening to the presentation and we appreciated that. And then the next step, remind me what the next step we will be doing is. What are we doing next? Mr. Berkman, do you wanna walk us through what's next? Sure, um, and I'd actually probably defer to, to Scott to kind of take us through those steps in terms of the timeline. But uh, yeah, there, there will be more discussion about what our next steps are legally. We would not be rehashing or re-deciding the part we've already declared the per property surplus. That, that part is not up for debate at this point. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. Um, as I put in the presentation, uh, you know, our expectation, we're in the process of negotiating a potential uh, exchange on both of those properties. Uh, we're waiting to hear back uh, legal comments from the prospective purchaser exchange partner on that. So that will drive kind of the, uh, the process. At the time that there is something that is, uh, uh, you know, a resolved exchange agreement, then that would be scheduled for hearing by the board um, at a regularly scheduled meeting, I would assume. Does that answer your question? Okay. Trustee Nelson. Um, I guess in two parts, uh, how long, Scott, um, did you look for um, a purchaser for the Hopland property. And the other part about that is, um, it have, is that, are we locked into this particular purchaser at this point, or is there an option? It, what are the options for selling it to perhaps after this meeting, because there's um, interest uh, to multiple other bidders at this point? So to answer that question, um, there is nothing that's formal in writing that commits the board to anything at this point in time. There's a proposal that we are working through uh, an exchange agreement on. And again, until the board signs off on that, the, the property is the board is the district's property. And uh, that, that's, that's where that is. In regards to the lights going out in my office here, um, sorry. <laughs> You know, this is the new, this is the new thing, you know, you don't move for a while and then the lights go out. Um, but in, in regards to the, um, uh, what we did and, and I'll, we're an advisory firm and uh, we, we, we're not a brokerage firm, although I do have a brokerage license, I haven't used it for 30 years. Um, but we, we did a very extensive uh, reach out to local brokers. Uh, in the area, as well as uh, talk to a lot of different developers from uh, Sonoma County up through Mendocino. Uh, we talked to a lot of potential users, uh, people that we felt, uh, even business people in the area and business owners and companies that might have an interest in, in the property. So we did a fairly extensive outreach on all of that. And uh, again, 
we didn't go nationwide, um, but we stayed within the general area of uh, the Sonoma, Mendocino, Napa, general Bay area, and talked to a lot of different people uh, about that, about both of the properties. Did so that answer your question? It, uh, so if, if there was an interested party that stepped up to the plate with a legitimate offer, um, we're, we're still up for a bidding war on, on either one of the properties. There's been nothing that's been signed or agreed to by this board for anything. So Superintendent Cuban, if there were an interested party, would they contact you or Mr. Berrickman? Um, currently, uh, we've been using Terra Realty to, um, to do that process. So they would contact, uh, to contact the district through Mr. Berrickman, but refer to Terra Realty. Okay, great. And Terra Realty's um, information, as you see on the last page of their presentation here, is all right there. And that is on the website. Anything else? Trustee Nelson, I thought you had two questions. Did that cover both of them? Uh, I was just wondering how much time was spent looking for customers, um, uh, partners for purchase, and uh, if there's an opportunity for the future. And uh, yes, both were answered, thanks. Thank you. Maybe just to expound on it just a little bit more because I said that we had an extensive outreach, but that's happened over the last, uh, you know, 14 to 16 months. Once we understood what was there, we really couldn't go out and talk to people until we understood what was there. So again, over the last 12 to 16 months, we've been talking to a lot of different people. Okay. Anything else for the good of the order? Okay. And one last time, this was just for information, no votes taken. Please join the conversation. We welcome you at all of our board meetings, whether they be through Zoom or once we're released from our shelter in place, we'll be back meeting um, in public. Thank you very much for your attention. We do appreciate it. Thank you guys. It was nice to see your faces. Are we hanging up now? Yes.